Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today's podcast is brought to you by all of our patrons. We're doing some additional rewards right now while everybody's sheltering in place. So this Saturday, we're going to do another watch party on Discord. Yay! And we'll be watching The Lost World, Jurassic Park. You may have seen that coming. <laughs> and if you'd like to join, head over to patreon.com slash I Know Dino. This week in our 280th episode, we have a bunch of news, including a new dinosaur reported in Amber and some more dinosaur activities that you can do at home. And we have Dinosaur of the Day, Sora Pelta. But before we get into all of that, we'd like to thank some of our patrons who are the driving force behind I Know Dino. And this week, we'd like to thank Lucas and Eli, Wyatt, the Georges family, John Heck, Ranger Chris from Dino for Hire, Ray, Andrew and Helena Webb. Callum, Ricky, William, Red Sox Rex, Wouter, Moss Utah Raptor, Verasa Raptor, Goji, Neil Ovenator, Aussie David, Ellen, and Christine. And Christine just joined, so thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much. We really appreciate all of you and this whole community, especially now. We had our first watch party last Saturday, and we had a lot of fun. Yeah, it was great. There were more people that joined than I expected. I think there were about a dozen of us, I would say. I counted there. 16 at one point. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. It was really fun. It was even more fun than I expected it to be because we were going on all these weird tangents. Well, <laughs> I think we talked a little too much about denim, Garrett. <laughs> I kept bringing up denim because everyone was wearing so much denim. It was weird. I didn't remember it. It was the 90s. It's a different time. <laughs> Everybody was wearing denim back then. <laughs> and Sabrina kept pointing out everything food related that was going on. Well, I mean, it's pretty interesting. <laughs> <laughs> we had a lot of people sharing some great memes and gifts too my favorite is the one of ian malcolm breathing heavily and then alan grant laying on his chest like shrunken down as if he's on the triceratops this is fantastic wait you shared that one I shared it twice <laughs> <laughs> in both of the scenes that it references but anyway, if you want to join our watch party, then get on the Discord Movies channel on Saturday. We're going to, I think we'll just do the same time. It seemed to work well. So we'll do that. Which was 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Yeah. And I'll put in like an exact sync point. It was a little confusing because last time there were two Universal Globe logos and which one I was talking about was more confusing. So I'll try to find a less confusing point this time. And if you're in Europe, I'm sorry. We'll come up with something to do with you guys. That isn't in the middle of the night another time. Yes. So yeah, if you want to join, if you're not a patron yet, then you can go to our Patreon page, patreon.com slash I know Dino. Jumping into the news, I'm going to kick off with a really controversial one. Oh boy. And it's controversial for multiple reasons. Yep. <laughs> but first I'm going to go through the science of it and what the paper actually says, and then we'll, we can talk about the controversy at the end. So... The paper is all about a new piece of amber from Myanmar, and it was written by Lita Shing, Jingmei O'Connor, and others, and it was published in Nature, which means that it's really short, because Nature articles are always short, but there are lots of pictures, including lots of pictures of sclerotic rings on the online version of the supplemental material, which is super creepy when you think about what they are, because it's like part of the eyeball <laughs> yeah. of a bird, but yeah, super creepy, but really interesting. Like all Burmese amber that we've talked about, it's 99 million years old in the middle of the Cretaceous. But that number, it turns out, is a little bit suspect because the amber is sold at a market many miles from where it's pulled out of the ground. And it's inaccessible to scientists unless they sneak in undercover, which they usually don't do. They usually just buy it in China or a faraway market within Myanmar. But there are some clues that maybe that range of the amber from the area might be more like 5 million years plus or minus from 99 million years old. So previously we've always said 99 million years old, but it might be like 95 or 105, which is a pretty big difference. It means that some of these animals may not have coexisted. Previously, we've talked about lots of other finds in amber from the area, including a tail with feathers on it, some wings, a leg, and another head of a different dinosaur. That one wasn't an antiornithine. But in this paper, they describe a new, quote, hummingbird-sized dinosaur, end quote. Pretty small. Yes. It's named Oculudentivus, and Oculudentivus means eye, tooth, and bird combined. A lot of people have pointed out that it should be Oculodentivus, because usually it's Oculo for an eye. So I'm going to say Oculodentivus, because it's a lot easier to say than Oculudentivus. <laughs> 
And the species name is Quang Rae, which is named after the person who donated the specimen. It's a good way to get a dinosaur species named after you. Mm -hmm. The find is basically just one really good skull. There's no vertebrae. There's no other details whatsoever. It's just like a skull, (laughs) perfectly preserved in amber, basically, which is really cool. And since it's an amber, it has all of its teeth. It has a sclerotic ring and it has really amazing 3D preservation because it wasn't squished or anything before it ended up in the amber. The sclerotic ring is kind of weird. It has spoon shaped scleral bones, which is more like what you see in lizards than what you usually see in dinosaurs. And the skull length is really tiny. It's officially only 7.1 millimeters long, which is just over a quarter inch. But that's this weird metric that they use in bird biology, which is the post rostral length. That's what they almost always talk about with birds. And that's from behind the nostril to the back of the head. And behind the nostril on a hummingbird or on oculodentivus is way far back on the skull. The nostril is like right in front of the eye and then they've got a big old mouth sticking out in front of it. (laughs) So it, it excludes a lot of the length of the head, but that's just how they compare birds for some reason. The real total skull length is about 14 millimeters long or just over half an inch from the tip of the snout to the back of the skull, which is still really tiny. I mean, half an inch is like, I can't even imagine a skull that small. (laughs) The crazy thing, though, is that about a third of that length is eye. (laughs) It's like five millimeters of just eye. And it really bulges out of the skull. It looks like a lot of those nocturnal animals you see where the eyeball is just like enormous and sticking out of the side of the head. That sounds a little creepy. Yeah. (laughs) It looks cute when you see it usually, like an owl kind of. I'd say the eye socket takes up most of the skull. (laughs) There's just like a little bit of head behind it and then a really narrow snout in front of it. And to give an image of what the scleral ring looks like, it to me looks like a camera at about an F4 stop with 14 blades on it, if you're familiar <laughs> with camera. That's really specific. Yeah. So like if you've ever seen what a shutter looks like on a, on a camera and then it's got in front of that, there's the iris type thing that the light goes through and you can change the size of it and it gives you a different depth of field. It's got these blades on it. It's depicted a lot in different icons and stuff, but it looks just like that basically. But since it's relatively closed, they're saying that the pupil wasn't that big for the size of the eye, and that probably indicates that it was diurnal or the opposite of nocturnal. It was probably up during the daytime, because otherwise you'd expect the scleral ring to allow for a bigger pupil in the middle, and it wouldn't be so closed off. Hmm. And then, you know, it could absorb more light, and then you'll be able to see better in the dark. The researchers think that the eyes are on scale with an adult bird with a tiny head. (laughs) So they did this graph where they had the skull length and then they had the eye size and it sort of lines up along that trend line. So they think that the skull was an adult? Yeah. And it just had really big proportionally eyes because that's what you see on really small birds. Mm. Hmm. Never really thought about a hummingbird's eyes before. Yeah. (laughs) But I guess they're big. Yeah, proportionally to the skull, especially if you're considering the length of the skull being that weird post-nasal thing Mm -hmm. and not the big beak sticking out for the nectar. Another reason they think it's an adult is that some of the bones in the skull are fused, but they're unusual bones to be fused in a bird. It's kind of an unusual order, they said, for bones to have fused. And they say that might have given a stronger bite force. And along those lines, it doesn't have an antorbital fenestra, which is the hole in the upper jaw near the eye. If you think about like a T-Rex, it's got that sort of triangular thing right in front of the eye, the hole in its head (laughs) that isn't an eye. That's the antorbital fenestra, and it's in virtually every dinosaur. So it's really weird that it's not in this one. The only hole at all in front of the eye is actually a really small nares, you know, for the nostril. And when you realize that it completely lacks pneumaticity, it it really makes you scratch your head of like, what's going on with this? And the research was basically proposed, well, it's really tiny, so there wasn't room for pneumaticity, and maybe it needed extra strength, so maybe it lost some of that pneumaticity. So like I said, the snout is really narrow and pointed, similar maybe to like a pterosaur or like a gharial or something. It's just that really long, slender snout, even more so than most... (laughs) dinosaurs that have a long slender snout like a spinosaurus or something and it has a ton of teeth it's got 
41 teeth in its upper jaw and about <laughs> 60 teeth in its lower jaw. Well, they're really packed in. Yeah, and so tiny. I mean, these are smaller than a millimeter, these teeth, because you can imagine if there's 30 teeth just on one side and that has to fit in less than 15 millimeters of length because the jaws aren't the full length of the skull. Right. Yeah, these are really tiny teeth. The teeth are conical and super weirdly also, they don't sit in roots in the bone in their mouth which is like how our teeth are, and basically all dinosaur teeth. Instead, they just hold on to the bone with ligaments, and it's this weird thing called acrodont or pleurodont geometry, if you're familiar with teeth anatomy. And then thecodont is what we are and what dinosaurs are, and it used to be considered this group of animals, but not anymore. I should also mention that squamates, essentially snakes and lizards, are usually acrodonts and pleurodonts. So... Another weird thing about this dinosaur it makes it a little more lizard-like. A lizard-like, bird-like dinosaur. Yeah. Another super weird thing is the teeth extend back in the skull past where the eye starts. So if you imagine you've got a dinosaur skull and you've got the orbit where the eye would be, the teeth and the jaw goes all the way back to the eyeball. And sometimes in dinosaurs you see the jaw go all the way back, you know, because it can attach pretty far back in the head. But usually the teeth are only in the front and middle part of the jaw, not all the way near the back. So this dinosaur is basically all eyes and teeth. Yes, which I think is why they named it oculodentivus. Yep, because that makes it's got sense. the And also the fact that the teeth are under the eye. There's only one other dinosaur that has a tooth under its eye, and it's just one tooth at the very back edge of the dentary in Ichthyornis barely reaches the eye. But in oculodentivus, there are four teeth. (laughs) So it's even farther back than you see in ichthyornis. At first, they were thinking maybe it has teeth because it's a piscivore, because a lot of the other animals around then were starting to be toothless. But the teeth aren't pointed backwards. And you can actually see its tongue a little bit too, because it's fossilized in amber. And the tongue doesn't have those spiky barbules pointed backwards like you see on pretty much all piscivores so it probably wasn't eating fish and based on the tooth shape it was likely a predator and that essentially leaves that it was probably eating invertebrates like bugs that are also found in amber especially given its size like what else could it possibly be eating it's so tiny right (laughs) the authors say oculodentivus quote appears to represent the smallest known dinosaur of the mesozoic era rivaling the bee hummingbird end quote The bee hummingbird, by that name, you know it's small. Yes. I think we might have talked about it before. It is the smallest ever dinosaur because birds are dinosaurs. Bee hummingbirds have a that weird rostral skull length thing where it's not really the full skull length of 8.8 millimeters, whereas oculodentivus is 7.1 millimeters. So it is technically shorter by this measurement. I'm not sure how long the total of a bee hummingbird is, but it's close, right? It's Mm -hmm. really small. The researchers propose it may have had such a small size because the area of Myanmar it was found in was an island, and therefore it's an island dwarf. It's a pretty extreme case of island dwarfism if you're getting down to like skull less than an inch. I'm not sure if that's the only reason you'd get that small, but I guess it's one reason. In their phylogeny, it's probably not surprising since it has so few details in common with other similar age dinosaurs, but it came out outside of all the groups that are known, which is usually what happens if you have something that just looks really weird. And basically, it came out as one notch more derived than Archaeopteryx. So it's like a bird, but it doesn't have anything in common with anything. And it has more derived traits than Archaeopteryx, so it's just kind of off on its own. The author is also sort of couch their discovery by saying, quote, given the unusual morphology of oculodentivus, which is clearly unlike that of any other bird, there is a strong potential for new data to markedly alter our systematic conclusion, end quote, which I think is basically them saying this might not be a dinosaur or a bird because it's too weird. Yeah, it's got all of these lizard like traits. And I couldn't find any official responses to this paper yet. I was kind of waiting to cover this because I wanted to see what other people might have called it. But there were a couple blog posts that discussed it by paleontologists. So Mickey Mortimer published on the Theropod Database blog that she thinks it's a lepidosaur based on the details in the paper, like the teeth that aren't in roots and the skull shape and the teeth being really far back in the head and all that kind of stuff. And she also added that it doesn't have feathers, which you would see if it was in amber 
And, you know, we always talk about how we're getting all these feathered dinosaurs out of the amber there, Mm -hmm. which is kind of surprising if it is a bird. And Lepidosaurs, again, are the group that include lizards and snakes. So pretty far relatives from dinosaurs. Yep. But those weird teeth. Yeah. The comment section, too, of her blog post seems to agree. And they also threw a lot of shade at nature for not catching on to the fact that it could be a Lepidosaur Mm. or not a bird. (laughs) Andrea Cow also published on his blog, Therapata, that he thinks it's a Lepidosaur or something similar. He pointed out that young lizards have similar proportions to bird skulls, which is the main evidence in the paper for it being a bird. Remember, they had that graph of the skull length versus eye size, and they were like, yeah, it lines up. But it turns out if it was a baby lizard, it might line up too. So that seems to agree a little bit more with all the lizardy traits that it has. And just for fun, Andrea said he threw oculodentivus into a squamate matrix which is like all reptiles, and it came out as a very early gecko. (laughs) With so many teeth. Yeah, which, I mean, geckos, I think, still have teeth, but they're kind of in their gums a little bit, Mm. and they have huge eyes, right? They do, yeah. So after hearing that it was a gecko, I just stared at the skull for a while, thinking like, could that be a gecko? Yeah, I can see a lot of gecko-y-ness about it. So I think that might be a better placement at this point than calling it a dinosaur. But officially, on the record of peer review, it is still a dinosaur until somebody puts their peer review money where their mouth is. (laughs) (laughs) So that was actually kind of the minor controversy of the paper. The much bigger controversy of the paper is about where Burmese amber comes from. So many blogs and major news agencies have published articles pointing out that the amber trade may be funding military groups. And according to the UN and the U.S. Department of State, Military groups in Myanmar, or Burma, as the U.S. still officially calls it for some reason, are committing oppression, genocide, and using child soldiers partly to gain control of the amber mines. And there's also some questions about how mining practices impact the lives of the people of the miners themselves. So because of that, there are some pretty large groups advocating not purchasing the amber or scientists not researching the amber. It's a crazy complex thing. They're talking about the Kachin conflict that's been going on since 1961. There was a ceasefire from 1994 to 2011, but basically it's been going on for 60 years with a brief pause. And in that period, they've fought over tons of stuff. Obviously, it's a very long, drawn-out battle. So there have been a lot of other commodities and areas that were fought over as well. It's not just about Burmese amber. A lot of the articles don't mention that There's huge amounts of opium and timber and rubies and jade and all sorts of stuff in the area that's fought over. So it's not just amber, just so people know. We mentioned that the amber in this case was donated, which at first made me think, oh, that's good. So it's not really part of this whole thing, because if it got donated, then that means that it's not funding military groups. But it may have been purchased at some point. So it was donated by somebody, but that person probably bought it from a miner. And therefore, it may have helped fund some conflict. Some of the scientific finds can be really expensive, and scientists do go there and buy them, sometimes for tens of thousands of dollars. And in other cases, researchers just examine privately owned specimens, which is controversial for other reasons, because scientists always want it held in a museum so that if someone later disagrees with their findings, they can go compare it. But then in this case, it's kind of like, well, is that better? Because then you're paying money to this group that you don't want to pay money to. I don't know. As Mark Witten put it in his blog, this amber is, quote, the paleontological equivalent of blood diamonds, end quote, which is... A strong statement. Yes. And it sent me down a whole rabbit hole of reading about conflict resources. But I don't want to get into all that because that's not what this podcast is about. (laughs) Stick to the dinosaurs, (laughs) Yeah. So as a summary, some scientists have refused to work on Burmese amber or even comment on this paper whether that's in the news or officially as a reviewer in nature. And I wonder if that led to some, maybe the less than stellar review process of the paper. Maybe someone would have noticed it might be a lapidosaur if people weren't avoiding reviewing it for ethical concerns. Hmm. Until about last year, nobody was really talking about the conflict resource element of this Burmese amber, and neither SVP nor the Geological Society of America have an official stance on Burmese amber. Actually, in a science article last year, the president of SVP, Emily Rayfield, 
was quoted saying, in an ideal world, we shouldn't be bartering and buying and selling fossils, and then an ellipses, but sometimes there's a need to do that to keep them in or bring them into the public trust, end quote, which was actually pretty shocking to me that SVP said anything About other buying, than yeah. never buy fossils. Well, I don't know what that was geared towards because we've been noticing a shift at SVP lately too, talking to some of the scientists that said, oh, there's these amazing finds that we got by basically paying something for it. And we wouldn't have been able to do this work without it. Yeah, that's true. I think their official stance is that you can't work on private fossils, but I guess maybe there's some wiggle room if you can buy a private fossil. And then once it's in the public trust, you can do research on it. Mm -hmm. It's kind of in this case, though, I wonder, you know, is that the stance they want to take? I think they might end up revising that later. I would be really interested to see, though, how much of the amber sold is sold to scientists. My best estimate is that it's well under 1% because the industry is estimated about a billion dollars. And based on the largest collectors I could see that were science related, they can't have more than a couple million dollars to spend on this. So it is a very small fraction of blood diamonds. But depending on your ethics, you might say buying one blood diamond is unethical and you should never do it under any circumstances. Or you might say if there's really high scientific value, then it's worth it. So it's really a personal ethics decision, and there have been a lot of interviews with people on both sides of the issue. Obviously, the people who are publishing these papers think it's worthwhile to get it into the scientific record. Well, like we mentioned, in the other studies that have come out, there's these amazingly preserved feathers. Yeah, yeah, and obviously that's really nice to know about. <laughs> but some people have put out there some alternative approaches like not publishing on these finds until later when the conflict is resolved, presumably. But then the obvious follow-up to that is, well, if you're not publishing on them, you're just kind of hoarding them like a private collector, not really putting them into the public trust. So then you're back to that original problem of if you own it and you're not publishing on it, then you're not really helping science. And if you don't own it, the problem is these mines don't last that long. It's not like we talk about with typical paleontology where we can expect to be having dinosaur bones eroding out of the ground for thousands and thousands of years because we don't dig down to find it. You get amber in a similar way that you get opal. You dig a narrow hole deep down into the ground and you kind of go sideways when you find it. And amber mines get depleted. There apparently isn't very much amber left in China. And that's partly what's driven this huge spike in Burmese amber exploration because there's this really big demand and there wasn't a lot of places to get it from. So if we don't buy or accept donations of these pieces, they might just find a place in the jewelry market, which could really damage the scientific quality of it. And also, obviously, it's not accessible to science. So that's the downside. It's all very complex. Yeah. And it's even worse because the amber with animal inclusions are the most valuable. So it's like, even though scientists don't want to buy much of it, the pieces that they are buying are the most valuable. So it's, uh, it's really frustrating. I spent a lot of hours reading about it, but I still know I only scratched the surface because it's such a complex issue with so many different opinions on it. So for our part, since we, we're not going to do any research on it, obviously we're not flying to China or Myanmar to buy amber. Our decision is only whether or not to publicize and share information that's gained from researching this amber. And we've decided that we're going to keep doing that because our lack of sharing it isn't going to influence the purchase of the amber or anything like that. So at the very least, people can learn something from it, even if it is in less than ideal circumstances. Right. And yeah, so like when we talk about these studies, we can also talk a little bit about the background. Yeah. Some people have mentioned too that like the fact that we're talking a lot about Burmese amber specimens is shining a light on this conflict that's been going on for 60 years. And a lot of people are just hearing about it for the first time. And maybe that'll get some more international groups involved and help straighten things out and maybe get some ce a ceasefire going again or something. So we'll probably just mention that these are conflict resources every time we cover it to draw some attention to it. From now on, because we didn't know about it the first few times. Yeah, like nobody knew about it until last year or no scientists, it seemed like. Even though it's been going on for so long, it's crazy. But of course, we might change our mind too. Because <laughs> like scientists, if we get new data and better information, we have to change 
what we do. Do we have something less controversial now? We do. Oh, yes. good. <laughs> <laughs> so up next, we have some new tracks from the Isle of Skye off the northwest end of Scotland. No one was harmed in the finding of these tracks. It's <laughs> good, good news. <laughs> it was published in PLOS One by Paige E. DiPolo and others. And in the article, they describe some new tracks. There have been tracks from the Isle of Skye described going way back to the 1980s. I mean, it's not really that way back, but, you know, a couple of decades now. <laughs> and they've been continually finding more over the years. The tracks there are especially important because they're from the Middle Jurassic. They're about 168 plus or minus 2 million years old. So like 10, 15 million years before the Morrison formation. Now that's way back. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. That is way back. In this paper, they specifically describe two new track sites at Brothers Point. They call the localities BP1 and BP3. The area was probably on a lagoon or coast. It's kind of weird that there's no BP2. BP2 was already described, which was a sauropod and some theropod tracks. So now there's BP1 and BP3. <laughs> BP1 and BP3 combine for 50 new tracks. BP1 was found in 2015 and BP3 was found in 2017. So they're both pretty new. There are lots of track makers in the fossils, including different tridactyl prints, some that are, quote, possibly large ornithopod tracks, end quote. And large, they are very large, in fact. <laughs> They're about 30 to 40 centimeters, or 1 to 1.3 feet hmm. across. And that translates to a hip height of about 123 to 160 centimeters, or 4 to 5.25 feet tall. So their hip height might be taller than me. Yes. <laughs> And then their head probably sticks up farther than that off of a S-curved neck, as you always describe it. I would hope so, that the head was a little further up. <laughs> than the hip? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, they're kind of horizontal, you know. Oh, that's true. <laughs> Good point. The ornithopods don't have a handprint, so they're suspecting that they're probably bipedal because they think that the handprints likely would have preserved if they had been using their hands to walk because it's pretty mushy stuff and they have other handprints from other dinosaurs. Their best guess is that it's a dryomorph, which is a large group of things that are sort of like dryosaurs, if you're familiar. But we already told you how big they are. So you have a rough idea of how big that this ornithopod is. Then there's also lots of theropods, which range from less than 10 centimeters to over 30 centimeters, or less than four inches to over a foot across. So those are some big, scary theropods and some little itty bitty theropods. <laughs> They estimate that the hip height range of those was between 116 and 155 centimeters, or 3.8 to 5.1 feet. Then there's also a first for the sky, which is Delta Potus. Basically, it's a kite-shaped track with rounded corners. Hmm. And they think that that's probably from a stegosaur. There's been Del Delta Potus isn't a new ichnogenus to sky. We've seen it all over the world before, but it's the first one there. And... Since this is from 166 million years ago, it means it's really old for a Delta Potus track. So that's pretty cool. It also makes it one of the oldest Stegosaur fossils, period. And we've previously found Thyreophoran bones on the island. So this sort of lends some credence to that and might tell us by Thyreophoran they're probably Stegosaurs. Interestingly, the authors point out that the area is frequently visited by tourists and scientists but many of the tracks weren't noticed, quote, until the spring storms of 2017 moved the boulders along the beach to more opportune resting places, end quote. That happens a lot. It does. It's like we were talking about where we can continue to find dinosaurs for so many thousands of years because they just keep eroding and things shift over. And then it's like, oh, what was was this here the whole time? <laughs> <laughs> just an inch below the surface or hiding behind a boulder in this case? And it really emphasizes how important it is to go back to places to check if anything's changed, anything new pops up, which I know every time we interview paleontologists who go in the field, they usually say the first thing they do is they go back to all their previous dig sites to see if there's anything new there. And then they go out and look for something new. In less scientific news, we've got a lot of updates about things happening around the world because of COVID-19. Most of these are uh, things you can do to keep yourself entertained and occupied. Fun stuff. Yeah. 
But the first one, though, I should mention uh, is the Natural History Museum of Denmark. They have postponed the opening of the exhibit King of Dinosaurs, which was going to feature the T-Rex Tristan Otto. They don't have any new dates yet, but when it opens, the exhibit will show the relationship between predator and prey. And dinosaurs on display will include Triceratops, Allosaurus, Nanosaurus, Deinonychus, in addition to Tristan the T-Rex. Cool. It's not surprising. You can, I think, assume that any new museum that was supposed to open or have a new exhibit isn't going to happen for a couple months. Right. And this isn't a new museum. It's just the exhibit. Yeah. But now on to the fun stuff. So we've been hearing about a lot of neighborhoods that are putting dinosaurs and other toys or stickers in their windows so that kids and parents can go on scavenger hunts and have things to look at when they're going for a walk. I know our neighborhood's doing it. We're thinking of putting out some of our dinosaur toys in the windows. (laughs) So that could be something you do if you're not doing it already. For people who use Tinkercad, that's a free online 3D modeling program, there's a Create a Dinosaur Tinker Together challenge that's going on right now. Ooh. Yeah, so the challenge is you create and pose an original dinosaur. But don't worry, you don't have to build anything from scratch if you don't want to. You can use parts from their dinosaur collection as well as dinosaur models from the Smithsonian collection because the museum made hundreds of 3D scans of artifacts available through their open access initiative earlier this year. And they already have some good examples. That's cool. I've used Tinkercad. It's pretty easy to use software. Yeah. You basically start from very simple geometric shapes, like you can make a sphere or a cylinder or a pyramid. (laughs) And that's about it. There's not a whole lot of shapes to start from. And then you have to combine them in a bunch of ways. So it's almost kind of like Legos or something, putting it together. Yeah, it's pretty fun. But you can obviously make them very small and then make it incredibly detailed if you want to. And then if you have a 3D printer, you can print it. Yep. That's why I usually use it because I'll design something in there and then print it. There's also some fun projects we've seen happening with uh, Google Chrome's T-Rex run game. That's the one where you use the space bar and you have the T-Rex jump over cacti. (laughs) And I've never gotten this far, but apparently you got to duck under a pterosaur too. Oh, it's not that hard. Well, I guess I'm not patient enough. (laughs) (laughs) Or your web page finally loads. (laughs) Yeah, something. (laughs) But there's a fun video. There's someone who taped a photo resistor to their monitor. And so that can sense the cactus on the screen and then trigger pressing the space bar so the T-Rex jumps. (laughs) So they're cheating is what you're saying. They made a little robot to play for (laughs) them. But someone also found a way to turn that game into a workout. So there's another video of... This guy making the T-Rex jump when he physically jumps. (laughs) And there's a video about how he connected and configured everything. And then people can message him for the code so you can set it up for yourself. Are you just jumping on the keyboard, smashing the space bar? No, he's holding a device that is configured so it knows what's Uh, going on. And then on the screen, he jumps and then the T-Rex jumps on the screen. That's funny. Yeah. Over the cactus. The article I found, or the post I found about it was saying, oh, it's more fun than just jumping up and down. (laughs) That's not hard to beat. Yeah. (laughs) And then last, Liverpool One has relaunched their Dinosaurs Unleashed Augmented Reality app, so you can use the app at home. Before, you had to go to specific markers. I think it was in Liverpool. It would make sense, Liverpool One. We haven't tried it yet, but the website says you can scan the markers around their website, and In the app, you can hatch, feed, and fight dinosaurs, and it's available on Android and Apple. Fight dinosaurs? I've never seen an app that could do that before. They say battle dinosaurs. I wonder if the dinosaurs battle themselves. Wow. I'm not sure. That's fancy. We should try it this weekend. Yeah. And before we get into our dinosaur of the day, quick reminder that we're doing another watch party on Discord on Saturday, and that's going to be The Lost World Jurassic Park. I was called Jurassic Park the Lost World, but apparently officially it's the Lost World colon Jurassic Park. Now we know. <laughs> yeah. So we're going to watch it at 7 p.m. on April 11th Pacific time. And that's 10 p.m. Eastern. I don't think we had anybody join from Australia last time. Hopefully we get somebody this time. It is a little bit earlier in the day. I think it's like noon in Australia on the East Coast, at least. Yeah, it'll be a lot of fun rewatching this one. It's been a few years since I've seen this one. Yeah, we rewatched Jurassic Park pretty frequently, I feel like, but not so much the others in the series. Yeah. (laughs) We'll probably go through all of them. I think the following Saturday we'll probably do Jurassic Park 3 and then Jurassic World and then Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom. Because why not? We're going to be inside. (laughs) Might as well spend spend the time with some other dinosaur enthusiasts chatting about denim as you do. (laughs) (laughs) 
I think we'll find something else to chat about. <laughs> There's so it's it's amazing all the things that you can find in these movies, the little details. Right. Especially if you know the movie so well. Already. Yeah. And everybody pretty much that's into dinosaurs have seen these movies multiple times and know their own little details. So mm-hmm. you share it with each other. It's really fun. Well, and this last one with Jurassic Park, we all knew what was coming and mm-hmm. warned each other like, yeah, the best scene's coming up or this line is coming up. Yeah. Or the memes like you were talking about earlier. Yeah. But yeah, I think that's because we all know the movie so well. Yeah. We'll see how well people know Jurassic Park 3, the well-known least favorite of the series. <laughs> I might know it pretty well because we have a board game about it. Oh, yeah. With Buddy, I was getting abducted by the pterosaurs. Billy, not Buddy. In my bad. I guess oh, no. I don't know it that You don't well. know it that well. <laughs> I need to play that game some more. I knew it well enough to know his name wasn't Buddy. I think we could do a two-player version of that game. We should totally play it. You're always the dinosaurs. We can trade off. (laughs) (laughs) But anyway, if you want to watch Jurassic Park, The Lost World, or The Lost World Jurassic Park, as it's officially known, then head over to patreon.com slash I know dino and join our Patreon if you haven't already and put in your Discord name and then you can download the Discord app and head to the movies channel and voila, you're ready to chat. It sounds like a lot of steps, but it's not. No, it's pretty quick and easy. But the first step is to join our Patreon. So patreon.com slash I know Dido. And now on to our dinosaur of the day, Sauropelta, which was a request from Tyrant King via our Patreon and Discord, as well as Marcos and Dinosaur4602. So thanks. Sauropelta was a nodosaur that lived in the early Cretaceous in what's now North America in Wyoming, Montana, maybe Utah. It was medium sized, about 17.1 feet or 5.2 meters long. Gregory Paul estimated in 2010 that it was 19.7 feet or 6 meters long and weighed 2 tons. And Tom Holtz estimated it to be 25 feet or 7.6 meters long. Ooh, that's way bigger. Yes. Sauropelta had a long tail that was about half the length of its body. One skeleton was found with 40 tail vertebrae, though some were missing, so there were more, maybe 50. Long tail. It weighed about 3,300 pounds or 1,500 kilograms. So it's about the same size as a modern rhinoceros. Yeah, I think a rhinoceros is a reasonably good comparison for an ankylosaur. Yeah, that's how they described it in the paper. Oh, too. cool. Yeah. So Sauropelta was heavy because of its armor and had large spines on its neck, and it was covered in osteoderms. One skeleton was found with osteoderms preserved in situ. It had these two parallel rows of dome scutes that ran down the neck. And the back and tail had ossicles and large conical scutes that ran in parallel rows. The hips had ossicles and large dome plates that formed a sacral shield. And it had spines on the sides of the neck that were larger by the shoulders and then small again along the side of the body. It ended at the hips. Sauropelta had flat, triangular plates on both sides of the tail that pointed outwards, and it had large shoulder spines. The spikes would have made it look larger and been intimidating, which could have been good for defense. Sauropelta was quadrupedal and herbivorous. It was probably slow moving. Its forelimbs were shorter than its hind limbs, and it had this wide body with a broad pelvis and rib cage and large limbs overall. It had stout feet, stout limbs, stout shoulders, and the feet were also short and broad. It probably had a web, quote unquote, of skin between its toes, and the toes were spread out to distribute weight, and it probably had padding to cushion its steps. Sort of like an elephant. Sort of. But not the same. No. <laughs> so Sauropelta was adapted to be heavy, and it had a stiff tail, a short neck that was also stiff, and a triangular skull that was flat at the top, not domed. So it had the stiff tail as a notosaur, but it didn't have the club on the end of it quite yet. Yeah. So it's like getting towards the club tail, but not quite there. It's more like a bat tail. A bat tail. Oh. Or like a baseball bat tail. Yeah. Not like a the flying mammal, mammal bat yeah. tail. <laughs> yeah. Since it was a notosaur, it didn't need the club. Sauropelta's thick roof of the skull had flat bony plates that were very tightly fused. They looked smooth, but that could be due to preservation or the preparation of the fossils. It had these thick triangular scutes that were coming out from behind the eyes, below the eyes, and near the cheeks, and it had leaf-shaped teeth that was used to cut through vegetation. It probably had a keratinous beak, and it may have been a low browser, maybe eating conifers and cycads. Would have been hard for it to eat anything high off the ground (laughs) with that low center of gravity. That's true. 
<laughs> so Sauropelta was one of the earliest known notosaurids, and the type species is Sauropelta edwardsorum. There might be other species, they're not named though. The genus name means lizard shield, and that name refers to its armor. Barnum Brown found the holotype of Sauropelta in the Cloverly Formation in Montana in the early 1930s in the Crow Indian Reservation. They also found two other skeletons. One of those skeletons had in situ armor and is on display at the American Museum of Natural History in New York. John Ostrom from Yale's Peabody Museum found more specimens in the Cloverly Formation in Wyoming and Montana in the 1960s and named Sauropelta in 1970. Ostrom named it Sauropelta edwardsorum, and George Olszewski changed it to Sauropelta edwardsi to adhere to Latin grammar rules. Sometimes Sauropelta is confused with the name Peltasaurus, which Brown used in lectures and museum exhibits, but was never officially a name or in the description. Oh, no. This happens sometimes. In 1972, the name Peltasaurus was published with a photo of one of the Sauropelta specimens, which probably added to confusion. But Peltasaurus is already the name of a North American lizard. Carpenter and others described material of a large notosaurid that was found in Utah in the Cedar Mountain Formation in 1999 and said it was possibly a new species, but they didn't name it. And later, Carpenter only referred to the specimen as a notosaurid. Other fossils were found but haven't been officially described, and they include a skull from the Cloverly Formation and a large fragmentary skeleton from the Cedar Mountain Formation. Possibly Sauropelta footprints have been found in British Columbia and Canada. Charles Sternberg found them in 1932, but it's not known for sure. They're known as Tetrapodosaurus borealis, an ichnogenus, originally thought to be a ceratopsian, now thought to be a notosaurid. That's according to Kenneth Carpenter in 1984. Yeah, it's pretty hard to tell the difference between different ankylosaurs by looking at a footprint. Yes. Sauropelta lived in wide floodplains near rivers that flowed to the shallow inland sea. There's lots of river flooding, so it was muddy. And after Cloverly, the shallow sea expanded and became the western interior seaway. Other dinosaurs that lived at the same time and place as Sauropelta included the ornithopod Tenontosaurus, which is the most common herbivore there, the ornithopod Zephyrosaurus, Titanosaurs, the theropod Deinonychus, the Ovaraptorosaur Microvenator, and the theropod Acrocanthosaurus. And other animals, not dinosaurs, that lived in the same time and place as Sauropelta included lungfish, mammals, turtles, and crocodilians. And if you want to play with a Sauropelta, <laughs> one of Mattel's 2020 Jurassic World Primal Attack toys is called Savage Strike Sauropelta. Savage Strike. That's pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> Reminds me of Future Man, if you were to say the act <laughs> that you're doing. It'd be like, tail whip. <laughs> Savage strike. Ah. <laughs> yeah. And our fun fact of the day is about Amber, because I was researching so much about Amber, it was kind of ridiculous. So there is potential, I'm going to claim, to get some information from the entire Mesozoic, all of dinosaur history, using Amber. And that's because... The earliest amber find was before any of the dinosaurs were discovered, and then it dates until after all of the dinosaurs went extinct. I'm talking about non-avian dinosaurs. Real quickly, an aside, the name amber derives from ambergris, which is basically a sperm whale bile that's sort of solidified and gross, presumably because both float in seawater and look a little bit similar. But the use of amber as a color came later. So the color is because that's a typical color for the material. So just like fossils, amber comes from all different times depending on where you dig it out from and what the stratigraphy is. The earliest amber find was from the Carboniferous about 320 million years ago in Illinois, turns out. Not surprisingly for the Carboniferous, it was in a coal mine because a lot of the Carboniferous stuff is coal. There was just tons of coal forming in the Carboniferous. That's basically why it's the Carboniferous. Lebanon and Jordan have some amber from the early Cretaceous about 130 million years ago. And that's the oldest amber that's ever been found with animals in it, specifically insects. That's usually why you get an amber anyway. Although there are some reports of Jurassic amber from Lebanon, but I couldn't find out if that actually had insects in it or not. But yeah, we're starting to get more amber from around different dinosaur periods. Could be exciting. Start to see some of those early dinosaurs, maybe, whether or not they had feathers. That'd be super cool. Unfortunately, the biggest deposits of amber are on the Baltic coast, but they seem to date from the Eocene, which at the earliest was 56 million years ago, so after dinosaurs went extinct. So we're not going to get anything from these huge deposits that are there. And then back to Burmese amber. 
The reason it's so valuable is because it has a crazy high rate of animal inclusions. One Canadian dig found that in each kilogram, they had about 46 organisms. Wow. Yeah, it's a crazy number. And Burmese amber pieces can also be huge, with science reporting that, quote, single pieces regularly approach the size of cantaloupes, end quote. A cantaloupe of amber. That's crazy. It is. <laughs> it's almost like a soccer ball or something. That's so huge. I've never seen one that big that had like a dinosaur in it. But could you imagine if you had a cantaloupe, you could fit like an entire bird in that one piece of amber. That'd be amazing. Or like even a skull of like a reasonably sized dinosaur somehow. That'd be so cool. Researchers also estimate that several thousand organisms will eventually be described from Burmese amber and thus why it's so scientifically important, although controversial. One last aside, amber comes in an array of colors. It's not just amber in color. It ranges from black to yellow and whitish along that sort of yellow spectrum with orange and brown in between. But there's also red amber, which is known as cherry amber. It's usually kind of a reddish brown, although if you search for it, you mostly find plastic because people make tons of plastic and call it amber. It's weird. There's also green amber, which is really rare, but it's possible in the right conditions with the right minerals and stuff in the area. It's often enhanced by chemical and heat treating to make it more green. And you can also use heat to make amber flexible and then fake stuff, <laughs> which was probably the way someone tried to sell Lita Shing the first turtle in amber, which turned out to be a fake. Hmm. The most rare amber of all is blue amber and is exclusively from the Dominican Republic. And fortunately for scientists that study dinosaurs anyway, it's only 20 million years old. So we're not competing with the jewelry lovers in that area because I have no interest in it, and I don't think any dinosaur paleontologists do either. So you can keep that blue amber. We don't need it. <laughs> <laughs> and that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss out on any new episodes. And consider joining our Patreon. Watch some movies with us through our Discord. It's, uh, it's patreon.com slash I Know Dino. Thanks again. Until next time. Good day.